privilege of getting to know David over the course of the last year, working with him as my sponsor. And, um, you know, words can't really begin to describe or express how much gratitude I have for him. Um, he's uh, had an incredibly uh, positive influence on my life, and it hasn't always been easy work, but um, I, uh, I'm a little bit biased, but uh, I've never actually had the opportunity of hearing him speak, so with uh, I don't know. Thanks. Hi everyone, my name's David, I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Thank you, Daniel, for asking me yesterday to do this. <laughs> um, I'm, I'm honored to be here. Welcome to the new people that are here today. It's, uh, um, you know, coming to Alcoholics Anonymous is like, holy shit, where am I? And, and uh, um, just a, a little bit about my story. I, uh, you know, I, I never thought I would end up in Alcoholics Anonymous. I had some judgment around AA, uh, and I kind of thought AA was for losers. And, and there's some truth in that. <laughs> <laughs> I had to lose just about everything yeah. to get here. And and, uh, um, and and then surrender the rest, you know, to stay. Um, so uh, welcome, and, and uh, this is uh, uh, this is where, really, in a way, with the winners, you know, we all become winners here. And, and uh, uh, if there is such a thing as a as a winner and a loser, um, you know, I I want to start first by kind of identifying uh, as a, you know, David as an alcoholic. And, and uh, um, the first thing that, that, that comes to mind to share is that, that I, alcoholics have what we call a, a spiritual malady. And, and uh, um, there's a, something missing in, in, in us generally, and, and in my case, uh, from a very young age, <clears throat> before I drank, I felt like something was missing, um, and, and uh, a bit like a square peg in a round hole. Uh, I didn't really feel like I fit in. Uh, I knew that, uh, I didn't really know what it was that was missing, but I knew there was something something wrong with me. And, and, uh, um, and I remember uh, very young, um, looking on the spiritual side of things. I'm talking about, you know, eight, nine years of age, uh, reading the Christian New Testament at night with a flashlight, trying to find something, you know, and, and, uh, <coughs> and there was an old guy down the street, Mr. Bent, who lived in a house he was like a, had the big old house in the community that had been there long before the other houses were built and uh, um, he you know went to the Anakin church where my mother used to drag us where I got my first ideas about God in Sunday school at the Anakin church which took a long time to unlearn and and uh, um, old Mr. Bent and I connected all the other kids were afraid of him you know he was you know, I lived in a kind of a neighborhood where it was a new development and most of the families had young children. And Mr. Bent was probably in his 70s. And he and I connected and, and uh, um, you know, I went and, and would talk to him. And um, so I was looking, you know, for something. And I remember that Mr. Bent actually gave me a book of Psalms, uh, which is a, a book in the Old Testament. And he wrote, you know, he signed it, and I still have it. You know, I would have been, you know, like eight or nine or ten years old, and and so I was looking for something. I didn't, you know, uh, know what it was I was looking for, but but I, I knew I was looking for something, and and, uh, uh, and then probably when I was about thirteen, I found it. It came in a bottle. <laughs> I had no idea where they had been hiding it. Uh, I thought it was in a book or in a, no, it came in a, in a bottle. And, and uh, um, so for some time, 
my search, uh, you know, for it elsewhere stopped. I had found it, and, and uh, when I started to, to drink at about 13, I drank what we would call alcoholically uh, from day one. And and uh, and this is kind of the other qualifier is that I I never social drank I I you know I never saved the cap you know people take a cap off a bottle and you know put it in their pocket I never saved the cap there was going to be no need for the cap and and and, uh, and the way I drank there were there were no corks right on, on the dollar sixty five wine that I used to buy and and, and uh, when I was a kid and and, and uh, um, so what happened to me when I drank is that uh, I was always aware of how much was left and where was I going to get more, you know, and, and, and that separates me from the, from the, you know, uh, even the hard drinker, I think, you know, I, I, um, <coughs> I didn't drink like some people I know who, uh, you know, lock themselves in a hotel room and drink for, Till you know they have to go to to the hospital. Um, I, I drank uh, where I would get shit faced, falling down, going to jail drunk. Uh, but usually I'd be able to pull it together the next day in some way. You know I would be able to. Uh, I didn't have to drink day after day. And, and uh, but when I did drink, you know, um, I, with with all good intentions, uh, I, I would convince myself that. I was going, I, I remember uh, I was living with a, a, a lady, young lady here in Calgary in my teens, early teens, and, and I was working up at the new airport, we called it then. Uh, it's the old airport now, but it, and, and uh, uh, hanging precast, and I, I liked all those concrete, you know, iron worker guys, and, and, uh, and we would go to the crossroads for two and a juice, right? And like, and I believe it, honey, I'm going for a couple. I'm only going to take $5. And, and I would, you know, I would say, I'm going, and I'd take $5 so that I would only go for a couple, right? But I would borrow money or steal it or, or whatever I had to do to stay and, and, uh, and finish the deal. Hi, you guys. What's up, hey. Hey. <laughs> so, so that kind of, qualifies me. I'm, I'm not a, uh, a social drinker. You know, I'm a, I'm a, a, a man with a spiritual malady and, and I used uh, drugs and alcohol, but primarily alcohol. Alcohol was my drug of choice. did lots of drugs, but often I did drugs. Some of you relate to this. I did drugs so I could drink more, right? And, and uh, and uh, I wasn't, you know, I, so I was never really a, a good druggie. I was, I did, yeah, I do lots of cocaine so I could stay up and drink more. And, and uh, um, uh, so th there I was with this sense of restlessness and irritability and, and uh, something's wrong idea in, in, in my psyche. And, and the only thing that would make it right was to drink, and, and uh, um, so I, I remember uh, living over in the in the northeast in Renfrew, and there used to be a liquor store over on Center Street and, and 16th Avenue, and I would get that sense of ease and comfort on the way to the liquor store, you know, and, and uh, these were all kind of qualifiers that, you know, uh, n normal drinkers don't get that. You know, they're like, oh, shit, I forgot to buy wine for tonight. Oh, well, maybe I won't, I just won't have any, you know, not me. I, you know, I, I never thought that way. I, I, everything was around whether I was going to get a bottle for tonight. And, and uh, so the sense of ease and comfort will relate to that. And, and uh, um, so I had it. I was the, the real deal. And, and what, what, uh, what happened to me uh, I ended up in, in lots of times in jails. I, I used to think that uh, like it was a badge of honor how many different jails I've been in across the country, you know, you know Vancouver and Toronto and mostly just city buckets. They weren't 
uh, and nothing prestigious, you know. <laughs> they, were, right? they were just city drunk tanks, and, and, uh, and I'd wake up and, you know, and, uh, and they'd let you out, you know. You didn't even get charged. they just spring you in the morning. And, and, uh, uh, but I had, I, I glamorized that lifestyle. You know, I thought that, that you know, being a, uh, you know, a wannabe criminal was the deal. And, 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 and so I, I, I didn't have uh, uh, aspirations of, of uh, you know, running big companies or, or making a difference in the world. My aspirations, I thought that when, when I was a kid, I remember being in my late teens, early 20s and thinking when I go to jail, when I get big time, I'm going to learn to play the guitar, get in shape, and write a book. Right? This is when I'm when I when I get big time, and and uh, so I, I wasn't on a you know a, a, a trajectory for greatness. I, I was uh, uh, you know that's that was my imagining of of life, and and uh, um, but uh, and the other thing that some of you might relate to is that I I remember thinking as a kid I'll never live past eighteen. You know, and, and I damn near succeeded with that. I, I was drunk one day, like, you know, falling down drunk, and I borrowed some guy's motorcycle. I think I really took it. He was a young fella, and he may have said yes, but he was probably afraid to say no. And I, and I took his motorcycle, and I, and I, roaring down the main street of a, of a town in New Brunswick called Sussex, and, and I'm roaring down this main street, and, and the cops pull in behind me, and they turn on the siren, and, and, and all of a sudden I'm Steve McQueen, and, and uh, I'm, I'm running the cops, and I, and I got uh, uh, I'm bare feet with, a, with no shirt, literally no shirt, no shoes, and a pair of shorts on, and that's it, and, and uh, Anyway, so I, I, I was like 17, and, and uh, uh, the bike went into a high-speed wobble, and, I, and, and, uh, and I'm, I'm hammered. Eh? You know what they say, eh? Thank God he was drunk. He would have killed himself, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> I had to been drunk. I wouldn't have been on the motorcycle, you know, but that's what... Yeah. Have you ever heard that? Yeah, my brother had so many accidents, so we used to say, oh, God, thank God he was drunk, you know, because you get limp. And... and, <laughs> and uh, um, so I went off the road and had a high speed wall, went off the road and I hit a curb uh, or like a ditch, you know, uh, and, and I hit the, and, and, I, and I flew from the ditch to the house and went back later and paced off. It was 120 feet from the ditch to the house and I hit it just below the eaves. It was a two story house. And, and uh, so I got, you know, I got, uh, I got air. Yeah, I got got lots of air, and I bro I broke my back. I fractured three vertebrae in my back, and I tore my. I, had a, I got a big scar here, and all the, you know the flesh off my body. I had road rash, house rash, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, anyway, so, but that didn't stop me. You know, um, they told me that day. I remember in the hospital them saying you might not walk again. You know, and. Uh, and I was like, you know, I, I wasn't very nice to them in the hospital. And, and uh, within three or four days, they discharged me. And, and I went and bought uh, some beer and some, I remember, drive to going to the, my mom's, the, the summer home that we had in New Brunswick. Uh, my family had the old homestead and went there to convalesce, you know, and, and to heal the body. And I was just a scrawny little kid and, and, and scared, you know, terrified. And, and um, so I didn't think I'd live past 18. I didn't think I'd live past 21. You know, those were my self-centered thoughts. I didn't think I'd for sure live past 25. And at, and at 24, uh, this gal that I'd been hanging out with, that we'd been kind of calling ourselves a couple uh, in between when we weren't, and, and uh, she got, somehow got pregnant. And, and I had no idea. <laughs> she somehow got pregnant, and and uh, um, you know, and her demeanor changed. She was, it was, you know, should have get off the pot time, and and uh, you know, I was like, what what are we gonna do about this? You know, you sure it's mine? Every alcoholic's mantra. Right? <laughs> and, and talk about selfish and self-centered, right? Are you sure it's mine? And, and uh, anyway. Uh, so the boys, my dad and her dad, and you know, um, 
kind of decided that we should get married, and, I, and we did. And uh, so my come to Jesus moment, if you will, my wake up moment, my uh, came uh, later that fall. By the way, my brother had sobered up in 1978. This was 1980. And my brother had sobered up in 1978, and, and he'd bought me a big book. It wasn't this one, but I still have the one he bought me for Christmas in 1978, and I had read it. And uh, um, I remember reading the big book through 1979 and, and drinking beer, reading the big book and uh, thinking, well, I guess I'm alcoholic. You know, I, I could see myself in the pages. And I, and I thought, well, uh, so is everybody I know. Because I didn't know people who were an alcoholic. You know, that was the norm. And, and uh, I didn't understand the disease and I didn't understand how, how you know, much pain was yet to come. And, and uh, um, but so I had some familiarity. Bob was sober. He, he had uh, been sober now two years almost. And, and uh, uh, so, it, you know, I'm grateful he'd been 12 stepping me that whole time. I didn't realize it. And, and uh, um, so we got married. Uh, be, uh, my daughter came along. And, and uh, one night uh, at the end of November, I'd uh, been out on a tear. And, and uh, um, you know, with a bunch of my guys, and, and I was in, you know, I, by the way, I hadn't gone to high school, and I was in the drug business. You know, I don't know why she married me. I certainly wasn't a good catch. You know, what was she thinking? And, and uh, but um, I had to shape up. I had to do something. I had to pull it together. I had to find a way. And, and uh, I woke up this morning uh, so sick and hungover, and I'd been with uh, another woman that night, you know, and uh, I realized that, uh, that you know that this marriage wasn't working. She bought tickets to go home for Christmas, and somehow, in the vague recollection, there was no return ticket. And and uh, you know, she, she was, her family is in Halifax, and so um, I thought, well, I, I'm gonna have to do something. I, I need to stop drinking, and uh, uh, and I thought that was you know, if I stop drinking, I get the heat off and. You know, but I, I never imagined that that was really my problem. I mean, I kind of knew, but I, I, I just I thought I, I've got to stop drinking. And, and uh, so I went to AA. You know, by this time I knew that that kind of that was the answer because my brother was sober. And, and uh, so I went to Garnet Block. I remember I dressed up. Some of you get a kick out of this, I, you know, because I'm a biker, right? And uh, and I got an earring, and I'm you know I'm a little hood. I fancied myself. A, a bit of a hood, and and, uh, and I took my earring out and put a sport coat on to go to the garnet block, and uh, I don't know, that, it was a bit funny at the time. It's the, for those of you who don't know, the garnet block's kind of our, you know, at the time was a bit as close to the street as you can get, and and, and there I was dressing up, but so um, that was the beginning. Uh, I had no idea that, you know, that I would never drink again. Um, you know, that ha has to be the grace of this higher power that we call God. Because uh, I, I, it wasn't because of anything that I had. You know, I couldn't stop drinking. I, I had quit drinking a lot of times. I was a good quitter. I just could never stay quit. And, you know, some of you relate to that. I, I quit a lot. And, and did I quit for a week or quit for, you know, but I couldn't stay quit. And, and uh, but somehow, you know, in the beginning, I, 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 I thought, okay, I'll, I'll try this and, and, and literally one day at a time. And, and uh, it took a long time for me to, to comprehend the program in this book. It took a long time. And, and uh, um, for, you know, I'm still getting step one, <laughs> you know, in, in a sense of, recognizing that my thinking is my problem. That, you know, once we took away the, the drinking, the drinking was my solution. Drinking was me my medicine, you know. Uh, and, and once we took away the drinking, I was in a lot of pain. And, and, uh, um, and I didn't have a, any relief button, you know. So f for me, in the really early days, because I, I couldn't literally read this or comprehend this or, or you know, or really, it, to, I didn't get much relief out of the steps in, in Alcoholics Anonymous in the early days. I was, I was cooked, you know. 
So I went to three meetings a day, often, two and three meetings a day, because that was the only place I could find some peace, some, you know, now I, I know now, what I didn't know then was that there's a kind of a vibration in a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. There's a, you know, I didn't understand vibration. I didn't understand, you know, consciousness. I didn't understand God. I didn't have any idea about anything. But I knew that if I went to the meeting, usually about 20 minutes in, I would be like, ah, oh. you know, I'd get a sense of ease. You know, I would start to feel okay. And, and uh, by the end of the meeting, I can't even remember all the shit I was upset about when I got there, you know, because I would normally come into a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous angry and, uh, uh, and, and, and afraid. And, you know, I didn't even know how to identify fears. You know, I didn't know enough to be able to know what I was afraid of. I just knew that I was full of fear and that I was uh, often angry and that um, my, how I saw life, the, my vision of life was that there was something wrong. And uh, um, that, that was, I mean, that was, those are the glasses I look through. Something's wrong. And, and either something's wrong with me or something's wrong with you and, and something's wrong. And, and uh, so I would get to a meeting and I'd be there for 20 minutes and, and whatever I thought was wrong with whoever um, or the world would disappear. And, and uh, so in the early days, that was my, my higher power, really, you know. And, and, you know, I remember guys saying, you know, if we're all powerless, and there's a hundred of us in the meeting, well, a hundred times nothing is still nothing. And, and I'd be like, oh, shit, don't tell me that, you know. And, and, uh, but there was a something in the meeting, you know, a, uh, call it a belief or a, a love or, a, you know, uh, caring that, that, that seemed to, to, to help me. Um, so I started on the steps, you know, and... Uh, and I look back now, I, I think it's funny that uh, um, the perspective of, like I sobered up in December 19, 1980, and, and, and uh, so we're coming up 23 years, or 43 years, and, and so my perspective, of course, is different than it was when, when I first came in, you know, um, or when I was sober. See you soon. Okay, um, you know, and, and I, I, I talk with what I call newcomers now, just which, which is kind of anybody with less than ten years, and uh, just kidding, um, but, but you know, because it, it, it there, there's a, there's something that happens when if we pursue this, you know, if we we stay in this, um, there's there's a there's a consciousness that comes. You know, and, and uh, I, I didn't understand God, but I thought there was something to understand, you know, and, and, and uh, all the teachers that, and I, and I want you to know in my years in recovery, I went around and looked at a lot of different teachings, you know, I studied, you know, Buddhism, I went to, to India and, and spent time with the Dalai Lama, I mean, I, I literally was looking for God. And and uh, but what I wanted was I want to under I wanted to understand God. And all the teachings said pretty much the same thing, that that it was beyond understanding, and beyond description, and and that uh, the, the, but there was a possibility in in the present, like in the book it says, may we find Him now. Uh, in th that that there was an experience of this and. So I had lots of spiritual experiences, but they didn't last. You know, I would have moments of, oh my God, this, you know, like I would get high on the moment, on the sunset or, you know, and, and uh, you know, but, but they were they were like uh, peak experiences or, or spiritual experiences, but they, but they couldn't hold them. They, they would, I wouldn't, so I knew there was something, but, but I, it, um, and it, it was almost impossible for me for many, many years to read and understand the instructions. You know, Bill created, uh, a, a, you know, a, basically a, a program of, that uh, helps us to have a, uh, a spiritual experience. And that's, if we accept that, that, 
that we had a spiritual malady. My problem wasn't drugs and alcohol. My problem wasn't women. My problem wasn't that I didn't have a, enough money or that I didn't, uh, you know, my, my problem was that I was disconnected from source, however we call it, you know, consciousness, universal intelligence, love, love, right? Describe love, you know. I didn't know anything about love. I knew a lot about romantic love. I knew a lot about emotional love, about needing somebody. But I didn't understand love, you know. I didn't it, comprehend love. I didn't, you know. And and uh, so, looking outside of myself for many many years, and and uh, trying to find, and and um, in this time. You know, thinking that uh, if I had financial success, that that would do it, would fill me up. So I tried to fill me up with a lot of stuff, you know, relationships and, and travel and my motorcycle and finances, and, and it didn't fill me. And, and um, so I kept coming back to this and, and uh, um, you know, what I've learned or experienced is that I was already too full of myself. And I, I, there was no room for this consciousness, this God as I don't understand it. You know, I was listening to Bob Darrell the other day and he said, my, my cup was so full that, you know, there was no room for anything else. And it was full of my wants and desires and, and, and ideas of what's right and wrong and what my ideas of what's good and bad, my judgments on other people and, and uh, my thinking I know what's best for you, you know. And so when I'm full of all of that, there's no room for this peace that, that is promised in, in, our, in our promises. And, and uh, <coughs> so the, the deal that, that, that Alcoholics Anonymous gives us is an opportunity, first of all, it, uh, you know, to see my resentments. He talks about our grosser handicaps. What was I full of? I was full of, of judgment, right? And, 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 and my judgment was that, you know, you had screwed with me and I was going to, you know, hate you for the rest of my life or be angry at you or at somebody that looked like you. And, and uh, um, so I was full of, of, of resentment. And, and that's why Bill, in, in, you know, he talks about resentments and fears and, and, and problems with relationships in, uh, in, in step four. Because they're kind of the biggies, you know. And there's a lot, it gets more subtle. I mean, it really does get more subtle. But we start to see the biggies that were keeping me full, you know. And I was... Uh, um, mad at my mother and mad at my dad and mad at my brothers and sisters and mad at, you know, the world. And, and so there was no room for me to have this relationship. So I, you know, even in recovery, spent many of my years in recovery, restless, irritable, discontent. And, and the only thing that would save my ass is helping others. You know, Bill said in the book that uh, when all else fails, you know, uh, work with another alcoholic will save the day. And, and uh, um, so that's been my go-to, uh, you know, for most of my recovery is, you know, um, giving it away. And, and But as I recognize that, that uh, um, my mind somehow uh, can't be managed by me, you know, and I, I I really thought for a lot of years in, in recovery, if not consciously, I thought I could somehow learn how to manage my think, thinking. And, and that if I could manage my thinking, then I could be free of this restless, irritable discontentedness. I could be free of this um, fear. F fear. I could be free of, of wanting things to be different or free of the fear of that I'm going to lose something or not get something, you know, and uh, um, and, and I, I recognize that it's taking years for, for me and 
you know, I, I'm sometimes almost a bit embarrassed by, and even that's just, that's ego in itself, but a bit embarrassed on how long it's taking to realize that I cannot fix myself. I could not fix myself. I could just surrender. And as I surrender, this thing that we can't describe, that, you know, that we don't know what it is, you know, that I had to also let go of all my concepts of, you know, because I had all these ideas that my, I call them my Sunday school Christian ideas that they gave me when I was a little guy that I had anger and resentment with. I had to let go of all of that. And, and, and as I let go of my anger and resentment and desires and, and, and uh, um, my old ideas, in the book, in how it works, it says we had to let go of all of our old ideas. Well, all of our old eyes, it, it is, that's a pretty tall order. But as I let go of them, this thing is there. It's, it's already here. I don't have to manage it, you know, because I thought God needed my help. But I, I needed to manage him, it, whatever it is. And, and, uh, and, and it, we're in it. And, and that's how I, how I see it, how I experience it, is that when I'm not here in in my idea of how things should be, then I'm in it. it, I'm experiencing it. It isn't something separate. And, and that's my experience of God these days. And, and so uh, Bill gave us uh, some steps so we can clean up some of what's got us filled. You know, I was full of shame, right? And guilt from all the shit I'd done, and the money I owed and the people I'd fucked around. And, and uh, so I get to let that go and, and I get to make amends. And, and as I do that, it empties me out. You know, I'm not carrying this idea of myself, you know, you know, this idea of myself of not good enough and not smart enough and not too old and whatever the, the, the ego makes up. Um, you know, as I let those go, then I'm, as I become more empty, um, this, what's already there becomes, um, of not, I don't want to say available, but experienced, it, you know, and, uh, and the promise is, we, you know, we, as, as we're experiencing this, we, we have, we lose our fear and we, you know, I mean, we're just, we're not experiencing fear anymore. We know peace. We, we have, uh, you know, we can be intuitive, you know, it, uh, Bill Wilson wrote a program for awakening, you know, and, and uh, I ran with all the new age people for a number of years in recovery looking for awakening. And it was in our, uh, it was here all the time. Do you, do you know what I mean? I, I, I did, I, I traveled the world looking, you know, hanging, drumming and chanting and doing kirtan and ecstatic dance. I loved it, it was a lot of fun, you know, and, and uh, had moments, had moments of bliss. But what Bill did is he wrote this, this detailed uh, description not only of how to to uh, have the experience you know to experience it but how to to kind of manage it on a daily basis and not manage the experience but to to uh, keep myself from falling back in to you know to uh, my old way of thinking and, and uh, so he, he gave me step you know 10 and, and 11 you know so uh, you know, 11 is thought through prayer and meditation. So I'm constantly emptying myself and asking for direction. Emptying myself and asking for direction. So, and, and when I'm doing that, then, then it's, it's, it, it comes through. You know, it's there. It's already there. I don't have to invent it. I don't have to understand it. I don't have to label it. I don't have to tell a story about it. It's already there. So, um, you know, Bill gave us a, you know, the detailed what to watch for, you know, for my, where am I dishonest, where am I self-centered, uh, you know, where am I fearful, and he gave us little prayers, you know, for my little resentment prayer, I love the, you know, when I'm resentful at, you know, somebody for leaving, it can be that simple, it's in bastard vertigo. You know, it just, it can, it's just like it's there, it's just a sneaky little thing, you know, and I can just, you know, uh, sometimes it's almost humorous. You know, it's like I call them my trailer park cousins. They all live in here. 
and they all there's about six of them, and they have a judgment on just about everything. And 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 uh, um, you know, rather than be upset with them, they're they're they didn't move out. They just you know got retired a bit. And and uh, but they they like to come up and 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 you know let me know that I'm missing something here. That there's you know that I should have a judgment on something. And so in in step ten, it allows me to see that and to watch for that and, and to pray about that. So he gives me some instructions on resentment. You know, God save me from being angry. I will be done. This person may not be well, you know. Um, and what does not well look like? Maybe this person's got fear. Maybe this person's, uh, you know, caught up in their own head and, and thinking that, that, you know, they got to go solve the problems of the world, whatever. And, and uh, um, so, you know, God save me from being angry, I will be done, you know, and, and my fear prayer. Um, one of the things that I, I want to say about fear, um, fear ran my life, literally ran my life. And, and uh, um, you, you know, I could, it, sometimes I couldn't even see it. It was like so, it was like being in a bumper car, you know, and, and, and it kind of kept me... Uh, on the on a path that fear thought was the right path, and and uh, so as I come to know fear, and and you know became more self-aware in that world of resentment and fear, so I could see it. It's like oh, there it is, oh, there it is, and 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 but when I when I realized, and Bill said in the book that fear set in motion trains of circumstance we felt we didn't deserve, right? And it, it, so it, he's basically saying that fear created my life. Fear, you know, to what I was afraid of happened. Does anybody relate to that? What I was afraid of happened. It's just like, you know, all the time my mom, you know, was a hypochondriac. You know, my mom was sick a lot. And and she talked about being sick a lot. I mean, that was the subject in her house was mom's not well. And and uh, and, and, and she was afraid of being sick a lot. And, and so I saw it as a child that, you know, what we what we fear we, we created and Bill said it in the book and so it's not only uh, not comfortable and but it's I, I it's a luxury I can't afford I cannot live in fear if I'm living in fear that's you know it's just that like, I can't afford it and, and so Bill gives us a prayer you know uh, asked to take away my fear and show me what he had me be so all of his prayers by the way are you know, have a kind of a second half to them that are, what's next? Guide me, strengthen me, show me how me to be. They're all, they're, and, and with the fear prayer, just take away my fear, show me how me to be. And, and at once, he says, we'll begin to outgrow fear. It doesn't say that it'll just magically disappear, but we'll begin to outgrow fear. And, and uh, so, um, you know, if that's all that happened in Alcoholics Anonymous is that we all, you know, outgrew fear. Wow. You know, and, and uh, uh, anyway, that, that's amazing. And then, you know, um, my relationships, I, I just want to mention briefly that uh, all of my relationships were um, selfish. You know, it was always me trying to get something, trying to, not wanting to be alone, you know, all, always with my relationships with women and, and my relationships with men who were my friends, you know. It was always something in it for me, you know. That was how I lived my life, you know. Even in many years in recovery, and, and uh, I, uh, you know, having a hot chick on my arm made me look better. I was really always very concerned about how I looked. Can anybody relate to that? You know, I wanted to look good, and, and uh, um, so that that was part of it. And, and so becoming aware of that in, in the, the you know the third part of of step four that that I had been that way, you know, that I would put up with a lot of shit <laughs> so that I could look good and, and uh, or that, or so that I didn't have to be alone. And, and uh, you know, I, I kind of w would be, uh, look at it that way, that, that uh, I, you know, w was in relationships often with people who were like me, which were, were not well and often in complaint and often angry, like they were like me. And, 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 and they were with me because they didn't want to be alone. And, and I was never kind of good enough, you know, and they were never good enough. So it was, it, it's interesting that, uh, that we do that, but I, I did that. And, and, and uh, so uh, it's beautiful to be 
um, at a time in my life to not need that, you know, to be free and, and uh, um, to be able to be comfortable in my, in my own skin and on my own. And, and uh, you know, that's a gift of, of, of recovery. So, you know, just to, to go in, into uh, recognizing that I cannot change those things. I have, you know, in six and seven, it says that we, we, we have to ask God to remove our, our defects of character because it, and in his time, not mine, you know, if, if, not that there's a him, but we, we have to call it something. And, you know, but in God's time, not mine, that, that my defects of character will be, let's say, eased. You know, I, 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 I can never, you know, in the moment, they're removed. You know, but there's always this idea that they're still there. They're still like the cousins living in the back room. And, and, uh, um, and then <clears throat> in 10 and 11, you know, having done... Uh, amends. Uh, the truth is, uh, I still have amends to do. I still have amends to do. I have some fresh amends to do. And, and uh, I think that uh, my amends have never been really finished. And, and uh, there's, there's uh, stuff that's, that's come up recently that, that needs to be looked after. And, uh, um, and, and f- for me today to be aware on a daily moment-to-moment basis in Step 10 when I screw up, you know, and when I um, and, and dish somebody or gossip about somebody or um, or uh, talk crap about somebody or, you know, to make an amend for that, uh, to clean it up, to talk to somebody about it, is, a, uh, you know, just a working part of the program. And, and I'm just going to, uh, and then for me also, prayer meditation, some of you know that I, I actually lead a meditation group where we get to teach what we need to learn, right? We, and and uh, so I love that I get to do that. I Monday nights I have a meditation group in my home, and, and uh, you know it, it's really simple. I see meditation is really simple. Uh, you know, somewhere in some book it says, "Be still and know that I am God." You know, so really that's kind of it. You know, so you know we go to my place and we all sit around together quietly and. You know, and mind, our minds are thinking, wow, this is pretty cool. You know, but then there's a spot sometimes where we just drop beyond the mind, you know, into this, this isness, this nothingness, this nowness. And uh, so prayer and meditation um, is, is uh, it's the deal. It's, you know, how do I connect? So I have to, I have to be still, I have to stop enough to, to uh, you know, empty the, the container. And somewhat, and then just allow it to fill in the moment with what 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 is here now, and become somewhat aware of that. And and and, uh, and then step twelve for me is 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 really my life. I'm at a time in my life when I have a, you know uh, an opportunity to you know um, to give back. I have a lot of time to do the work, and and I'm so I'm really grateful to be able to do the work. And and it's a new whole new set of of. Uh, trials for me too because you know I'm working with new people and they should fucking do what I tell them and, and they don't and, and uh, so I have to go through all of my wow you know they're gonna die and, and uh, so I get to live my my uh, defects of character in in, uh, uh, in, in, in service you know and, and it's a, uh, an opportunity there's no, no place in life where there isn't an opportunity to see Myself and, and uh, but I'm, I'm grateful that I, that I get to do this work and, and get to uh, hopefully be an example and make a difference. And um, went to a speaker meeting last night, and, and a young fellow spoke last night who I'd worked with a number of years ago, and you know been a sponsor and and uh, uh, you know did step work with him, and, and I hadn't seen him in quite a while because he'd gone out and had a real tough go, and and he, but he's back and he's working with some other guys and. And wow, he just delivered so well last night. Just delivered so well. And I was just, I had tears. I was just like, wow, you know, what a gift, you know, to see his life. And, and uh, so we get to do that. We get to surround ourselves with, with each, you know, with our, our people. And, and, and uh, um, today, uh, even, you know, in my home today, we're having a, a potluck. It'll be almost all 12-step people. And, and that's a gift. 
you know, we have a community, we have fellowship, and, and uh, so I feel really blessed to be part of that, and and and, uh, um, and and to be in relationship with, with, like in this room, with many of the people in this room, and and, uh, and relationships come with their stuff, you know, because it's like, oh my God, and and uh, so we get to experience uh, step ten and eleven, and, and with each other all the time. And, um, so I'm grateful, and I, I guess that's. That's it. I, I just have no idea what I said, but um, uh, I appreciate the, uh, the opportunity to share today. And uh, that's, that's it. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you.